should be fixed. All right. Yep, that okay. works. Hi. Well, Hi, Jared. Hi, Klaus. How are you? Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. I'm good. How about you? I'm doing excellent. Doing excellent today. Yeah. yeah. Part of our marketing and research team. Really happy to have you with All right. us. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, Jared's been very integral in scaling the DAO and building out our teams, Klaus. And I think that's that's something uh, uh, you know we were discussing uh, earlier about how to scale, how to build yeah. a DAO, and I, I think that's that's a it's a very interesting thing that's that's yeah. happening. Yeah, that's great. I'm gonna apologize ahead of time if my internet goes out. It's been a strange day. Yeah. <laughs> like we have this app that like, you know, is for our, our Wi-Fi and it says the Wi-Fi is out, but for some reason I'm working, like it, it works now. So <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but uh, forgive me if I disappear. Let's okay, see. well, it looks like uh, we have folks streaming in. We can We can give it a few more minutes uh i think here and then just get going um for for the majority of folks to to pop in yep yeah totally that's great And so for everyone that is here, uh, welcome. Uh, we have Klaus Scanning, and he's the CEO of DigiShares. Uh, Klaus is a member of the Standard Advisory Board uh, and has uh, quite a history uh, in asset tokenization and uh, uh, building platforms to distribute regulated securities uh, security token offerings as well. And we have uh, a, a chat, which we do check. And so uh, if any of you have questions in the middle of this or any questions for us or Klaus, uh, please feel free to write them down. Uh, and we will absolutely get to those questions throughout the conversation as well. Yeah, yeah. And I believe Klaus has almost three decades of working in tech under his belt, basically. And um, well, from from what I've from what I've researched, and so you know, something that we are curious of is you know how far along was it that you actually uh, sort of got into crypto prior to actually going pro in it, and you know, in the asset token yeah. side. I'm a late adopter. Uh, I bought uh, I bought a Bitcoin in 2014. Uh, for two hundred dollars, and uh, just uh, forgot about it for a couple of years, and then I stopped. I, I stopped in my one of my earlier companies uh, about two thousand sixteen or something like that, and I was looking for something new to do. And uh, together with one of my good friends, uh, we basically decided to go into blockchain as a kind of career choice, a career development for us. We thought it was extremely interesting what was going on, and. Uh, it was very early days and uh, we could see many, many business opportunities even, even back then. And, and we also really believe in the ideas behind the blockchain, disintermediation and uh, ability to create uh, non-inflationary uh, assets uh, and uh, yeah, work outside the banks and the existing financial ecosystem and just do everything more efficiently and, and less precise and so on. We really like that. So we, uh, we just, uh, started uh, looking at different uh, business models and uh, took a long time to decide what we wanted to do and we started actually another company first a company called venture fusion that uh, was really like a kind of uh, bootstrapped uh, tokenized uh, accelerator program for startups uh, so essentially having the opportunity or having the giving a, a startup or entrepreneurs the ability to tokenize uh, their idea really or their early stage project, even if even, even if it's just written on a blanket, uh, they could still tokenize it within our system and get uh, a number of uh, tokens 
ownership, representing ownership in, in, in the project. So maybe a precursor to a, to a DAO or something like that. And then using those tokens as, as, uh, as payment for anyone participating in the project in different ways. Uh, allowing people to bootstrap more easily, right? That that idea never never took off, and we couldn't really gain adoption for it. It, it was a really difficult business model, I, I would say, having to sort of build like a two or even three sided marketplace up at 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 the same time, which is is never easy to do. So it 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 never got off the ground, um, but uh, but it 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 led us to understand uh, the the lack of good technology for tokenization in itself, right? And the early concept of tokenization that we looked at already in 2017, where the, the, the first companies in the space basically started up, we saw their solutions. So we looked at their solutions and tried to see if we could use it uh, on with, with our project and, and, and just realized that we could do it better on our, our own. Um, so we, we made a pivot and started the DTCS basically back then to try to develop technology and infrastructure for this space. And I think we were among the first in, in, in maybe among the first 10 companies globally to start in the space or even five companies or something like that. And today we also see that. Uh, so the, 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 the leading companies in the space uh, are those that started maybe four, around four years ago. So um, yeah, a little bit, a little bit about that. Yeah, and I, I've noticed so that you are specifically like tokenized securities, not tokenized derivatives, not tokenized like commodities. Um, so with the tokenized um, securities market, is it the real estate market that we you would say is the more uh, has more market share so far, and as far as like being tokenized, or would it be the stocks and bonds? Yeah, I just looked at the, an industry report actually a couple of days ago, and uh, eighty-nine percent of what has been tokenized so far is real estate, right? Oh. So that's a pretty clear indication that real estate is it is the biggest asset class right now that we are tokenizing, um, and we tokenize shares in companies that own real estate, right? So, so we are so tokenization of shares is also uh, the majority. I think it's ninety-nine percent of the tokenization of real estate is done using shares. It's a little bit that is done using uh, where you tokenize the title or the deed. There's also a little bit that is done where you tokenize bonds, loan instruments, profit share type arrangement. But yeah, almost all of it is 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 a tokenization of of shares for various reasons. It's 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 easier from a legal standpoint, but it's also much easier for the investors to understand, which is important at the at the end of the day for investor protection. I think so. And I think like not very many people really understand like tokenization all that well yet. It's a concept that you sort of hear and people kind of talk about. They're like, I'm going to you know, like tokenize my house one day. Right. And, yeah. you know, and, and you know, give people exposure to that. Um, and I so think you will in a few years. Right. Probably. Exactly. You'll, you'll have the ability at least. That's and that's what we're, we're curious of. So like so when somebody tokenizes, say their, you know, their house, like what kind of market does it then go to after that? Like for people to get over to it? It's a big question, right? So no, no one is tokenizing the house yet, I don't think. Or at least uh, very few. If they, if they do, there's no real marketplace to sell it into at this stage. There's no liquidity in the market yet or very limited liquidity. There's only liquidity for the, the really big projects that are able to list on an exchange and pay 20,000 for that. Um, but but uh, companies are coming up, and uh, we are basically uh, power powering them with with our platform that will have the business model of of helping people to tokenize their own own homes. Um, so that will come, I think, within one or two years. Um, but uh, as 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 a homeowner, you you'd not uh, do it yourself, I would say, and get a platform like ours, and then just. Uh, uh, go off and, and, and do it. You'd, you'd work with, I think, one of our white label partners with a larger scope, a larger business model around specifically maybe tokenizing home, own, home ownership and also creating liquidity for it. Um, but I'm sure it will come uh, also because we are getting later in the year, I think the, the ability to use uh, real estate backed tokens as collateral for, for loans tapping into the DeFi lending ecosystem, I think will be huge for all of us and uh, enabling uh, DeFi uh, users, DeFi investors to 
to get access to real estate, much more stable tokens than what they normally see, right? I think will be uh, extremely interesting for them, but also just connecting the, the real estate world with uh, the, the, the huge innovation and liquidity that, that we see in the DeFi ecosystem will be, will be yeah, important too. I look forward to that day. Yeah, and cloud. Too. So you 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 mentioned two ways that that you you tokenize or you know a couple of ways, um, and you have tokenization of shares. You have tokenization of the the deed or the contract of the house. Can you dive in a little bit deeper to that? And uh, you know, I think some folks on the call for for reference, some people have no idea what what asset tokenization even is. <laughs> yeah. um, and others, others definitely understand, um, but haven't really heard it in this context of doing, uh, you know, actually being able to tokenize a home. Why would someone want to do this? And, and yeah. Yeah, good questions. So yeah, to start from the, the start from scratch, right? So tokenization is really just the ability to represent something with tokens on the blockchain, right? So just as you have rep we have represented the currencies as tokens on the blockchain, we can now talk we can now represent securities or assets as tokens on the blockchain. So we get the same benefits that we have with Bitcoin and all other cryptocurrencies. We can we can self custody the the digital currency or asset within our own wallet. We don't need a bank to keep it safe for us or to document ownership of it. We can do it ourselves. We have the blockchain guarantees that we know who owns it. Uh, we can also facilitate transactions, right? So we can facilitate trading, different types of transactions, and we could do it in a secure way. And again, the blockchain guarantees where we have the ownership. And if we make a trade, the, the blockchain ensures that we can trade without counterparty risk, for instance, using a smart contract. Uh, and we can do a lot of that stuff outside the banks and outside the exchanges because we have the ability now to self-custody the digital asset, right? Um, so that's a real innovation, I think, that we see behind Bitcoin and all the cryptocurrencies now coming to the world of assets and securities where we can do exactly the same. So we don't need to have, uh, in, in longer term, we don't need to have the land title register, register really to document ownership of, of properties, right? We can do it on the blockchain. Um, in 50 years, maybe when the, the legal side catches up, <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, that's the real innovation. So, so basically, what the way that we operate is that we take, we always tokenize uh, the the company that owns the property, right? Uh, which is sounds like a, a strange way of doing it, and not the most direct way of doing it, perhaps. But it's it, it is actually the easiest way to do it right now, in within the current regulation. Um, because uh, the, the, the securities regulation is very clear in most countries. And in, in most countries, you can also digitize everything within the securities regulations. You have this, the share cap table, you can digitize. Uh, share certificate, you can digitize. Um, and you can, uh, you, can, you, can, you can then also normally tokenize it, right? So, so um, in most jurisdictions, it is well supported to have a token that represents a share. And then when you sort of move that token from wall, one wallet to another, you can update the share cap table. All of that functions quite well within existing securities regulation in most countries. Um, the, the wallets, of course, need to be whitelisted. So, so the token itself is sort of self-governing. When it moves from one wallet to another, it can update the share cap table because it can see that it's moved to a new wallet. The wallet is ID'd and recognized and whitelisted, right? So we can update the share cap table. The, the token can also control whether it's moved, whether it can actually be moved to a certain wallet. Maybe the wallet is owned by a Russian or someone from another sanctioned country that we don't want to have as an owner, as an owner of this uh, token here. And then the, the, the token itself, it's self-regulating, self-governing and can sort of block that kind of transfer from happening. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of benefits in that. And there's a lot of ability sort of to automate transactions. So, so the main reason why you would tokenize your property is that you could, you can, you can really digitize and automate processes to a great degree. So 
you can make like a crowdfunding platform that, like the one we provide where people can just log in and uh, pay using crypto and get the tokens corresponding to ownership in the, in the asset the property into their own wallet and that transaction can happen completely within the, the, the platform itself it can happen completely without any ad administrator effort uh, so it's fully automated uh, the same thing with the trading so the trading can be facilitated by a plat platform like ours and you can have people trade in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion without counterparty risk um, fully automated uh, by the system with no ad uh, involvement from the administrator and then you could say longer term, of course, because all of us work use the same standards. So the tokens that we issue from our platform can be deployed and used, give value in other platforms like uh, exchanges. So we do, just did a project with T0 where we tokenized the property in Texas, and then it subsequently it was listed on the T0 exchange uh, for liquidity. Um, so, and, and longer term, as, as mentioned before, we will also gain access to the DeFi. Uh, lending ecosystem right um, so that that's sort of the hopefully the first part of the question the other part of the question was why not just tokenize the title uh, directly and the reason for that is that, uh, that, that there's a couple of reasons one the first one is that the, the land title register is normally not really digitized and interoperable or integratable uh, which would be a, 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 a strict requirement to be able to do it uh, even, but even if it was possible to somehow integrate with the land title registry, um, there would still be the issue of, of what would you actually sell the investors, right? Um, and how would you legally represent what they are actually buying into? Um, so if you take a land, a, a title of, of a property and you want, and you issue, uh, you basically fractionalize it and you divide it into 10,000 tokens, what, what would those tokens basically represent, you'd need to have quite a complicated investment contract drawn up by a legal guy to regulate value appreciation, distributions of dividends and rental income. What happens if one of someone wants to leave or the, the property is acquired or the property burns or something like that? Um, it is extremely complicated, right, to do that and to make that kind of investment contract. And it would be very difficult for investors to understand it. They would need to consult their own legal uh, uh, council right to understand that investment contract and decide whether they should invest into the project because there are no standards around it the only standard that we have today that works has worked for hundreds of years is to to tokenize a company right and tokenize shares so that is actually easier both from a legal perspective and also from an investor investor protection standpoint i would say so a yeah, long answer but hopefully it helps uh, that that's great, Klaus. Uh, definitely uh, gets into kind of the the meat of this, and it seems like liquidity. I we I, I saw that Proppy uh, they actually brought a home on chain recently, um, but they and they did it through bringing the deed on chain. Uh, however, it's uh, I don't believe that you can split that up, and so it's a six hundred thousand uh, dollar item. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's been brought on. Yeah. I don't really know exactly uh, how they would, you know, bring that to a secondary market. Is, is that something that you've seen as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've heard rumors of it at least, and I think it, fractionalizing that NFT will be really tough. Uh, but uh, yeah, maybe it can be done. I don't know. I think there's a lot of legal. There's not a lot of legal work in it, and uh, as if, if I owned 1% of that NFT, I wouldn't really know what, what I would own. And I think the legal sort of protection in it would be quite, quite poor perhaps, but uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think something that we're, we're a bit curious of as well is uh, you know, for, for us, you know, forming a DAO, we have a lot of uh, regulatory hurdles, you know, on our end that we're trying to work out. Um, and so in the tokenization of assets and especially like securities in particular, um, you know, and I know you're focused in the EU, um, is it very difficult to tokenize these assets based on jurisdiction, you know, nationally, um, or is it very similar? Uh, the U.S. is the easiest place to tokenize generally, I would say most of our, 
projects are actually in the US. It's the largest market for us. I think 20, 25 out of 60 clients or something like that is, is in the US. Mm. Um, tokenization of, of uh, shares is, uh, is recognized quite well in the US. And uh, as long as you stay within securities regulation, there's no problem with the SEC. It is actually more difficult in Europe and, and in Asia as well, because there's a lot of fragmented uh, jurisdictions, right, with each their own understanding of how it should be done. And in many countries, it's not clarified yet how tokenization can be done and uh, how you would uh, legally and techni technically represent the share with a token and what you do about the share certificate and so forth. And there's even more complicated regulation around trading if you wanted to trade those securities what kind of licenses you'd need and so forth and it becomes really expensive on the legal side too but there, there's a number of, of countries where we uh, we have done it at this stage and where it's it's open open for business i would say so uh, and it, it's it's growing all the time and the, the european union for instance is also bringing forth regulation to sort of yeah clarify and make this the same regulation in the entire European Union area. We don't really see the same in Asia. The Asia, Asia is even worse, I would say. It's, we have some countries like Singapore that is, in my opinion, really almost over-regulated in the space and is becoming sort of unnecessarily expensive for people to tokenize. And in, in, from our point of view, a, a tokenized share really is just, should just be viewed as a normal share just a, a digital version of it and nothing else, right? Uh, but, but some regulators tend to complicate matters and uh, lump, lump tokenized securities together with cryptocurrencies and uh, sort of get it mixed up sometimes and that doesn't help. That makes sense. That's, a, that's really unfortunate. I feel like for quite some time, we understood Singapore as like maybe a crypto sort of friendly, you know, <laughs> Place for you know people to go, and uh, I, you know in recent news, right? They've really cracked down, sort of I think uh, unnecessarily heavily. Yeah. Um, and so I think yeah. you kind of mentioned it before, but yeah, I think we want to delve into that a little deeper as well. So you're sort of saying we're a couple of years out from people being able to tokenize their home, but what does like the future really hold for the tokenization of assets in general, like? 10 years from now, right? Like what kinds of things will actually be tokenized and what is kind of unnecessarily being tokenized, do yeah. you think? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I think actually pretty much everything will be tokenized eventually, right? So it's like the, the internet of things. I think we will see micro tokenization, right? Because the, the technology itself will become so commoditized and so cheap that anything can be tokenized. So it's also maybe a great push to the sharing economy, right? So it will be so easy to represent ownership uh, in different uh, assets, right? Both securities and uh, commodities and uh, just s s objects in general that you have lying around. So as a longer term vision, I think everything will be tokenized and on the blockchain and, uh, and uh, transparent ownership, right? And uh, a lot of, uh, and, and immutable, uh, transactions and uh, all the, the good benefits from the blockchain that we that we all like and but, so uh, but i don't know, you know that, <laughs> that part's really interesting uh there the idea of tokenizing everything you know there there are properties of blockchain the immutability the permanence um the eu has uh legislation that they put out and i actually found this out uh, probably uh two weeks ago um of the right to be forgotten of mm. people yeah. right? and i think that's that's really interesting uh when you think about you know bringing a, a an id yeah. onto the blockchain with we have uh folks in the us that i don't think that they share the same sentiment as the eu and so what why do you think that would be and uh, have, have you heard about this too I, I, i'd yeah. be interested to get your take yeah, I've, I've heard of it. Uh, and I know that the blockchain industry as a whole is trying to tackle it. Uh, I have I don't know the details, but but from what I hear is that it should not really be a problem. Uh, I don't think no, no one is is uh, looking to put um, personally identifiable information on the blockchain in any in any way. Um, 
So I'm not sure how much of a problem it really is. Of course, you will have you will have decentralized IDs at some point, but but those will be uh, again you will not be able to see uh, names and addresses and stuff like that. I think just by looking at the blockchain. So you still need to have some kind of yeah access to it uh, to to be able to 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 see it. I think I I, I don't know more about it. I'm 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 afraid. It's not. It hasn't been an issue for us at this stage, but of course we're tracking regulation globally, really, to all the time to see what we need to to do to to stay compliant. Let's see. I think we. So we have a few questions um, in the chat, and I think so. We'll start sort of in the first one, and it's sort of like about DAO governance um, in regards to tokenizing an asset, you know, through a treasury, like a decentralized treasury. Um, do you see sort of any issues with uh, it being restricted to like the management team having sort of sole control over that asset in the treasury or um, is that not even something that um, is even a problem? Mm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you elaborate a bit? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to like synthesize their question. So it says right. how, how the tokens should be split if, and if the management of the investments can be restricted to the management team only for the attention class. It, it certainly can, right? So everything can be can be done. It depends on how you write the smart contracts. With with our system, again, you have you have an administrator role, and you can assign as many administrators as you like. Uh, so so yeah, that can easily be be done. And I guess that that's all. That is also the typical way of doing it in a DAO. Um, I guess it's flexible. That's perfect. Yeah, and so with with your platform, Klaus, and with with DigiShares, um, what what has what has been kind of the uh, the thought around DAOs and and providing this this type of a platform for DAOs? Um, at, is that a path that you guys are going as well? Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, I, I'm I'm personally extremely interested in in DAOs and see uh, a great future for it, especially companies providing infrastructure for DAOs. I think it'll be huge, huge uh, market in years to come. But, but similar to the tokenization market, also an area that is uh, extremely dependent on regulation, right, and legislation around it. So we were actually, in some cases, recently we were called a legal tech company, which is, uh, I, I didn't really like to hear that because we, we have we have only one legal guy and uh, 15 software developers, but but uh, we are so dependent on regulation and uh, that um, we need to uh, stay uh, stay up to date all the time. And it's the same in the DAO space, uh, I think. Um, but um, yeah, so so we uh, we definitely we are very interested in, in in the space, and I think that the, the way our platform is set up, it can quite easily be customized to also managing or tokenizing <coughs> tokenizing the ownership interest of a DAO. Um, that should be relatively straightforward, and I think that um, a lot of DAOs will, will will need that kind of functionality in order to manage their their group of stakeholders, or token holders, uh, their rights, their voting rights, uh, communication, um, distributions of of uh, income of of different types. Right, I think all of that will be equally important for a DAO as it is for uh, um, an LLC. Right um trading of ownership interests and stuff like that all of that will be equally equally important yeah absolutely we uh we did have another question about sort of like the tokenization of sort of different kinds of assets um like outside of securities like something like gold or even like uh, other like natural resources like how um how viable is that in i guess 10 years from now I think it's extremely viable. Um, I, I think so, as viable as everything else. I think uh, we haven't we haven't seen it that much. So, I would say among our clients, uh, so we have seen tokenization of mining projects and uh, energy projects and uh, that kind of projects. We have a project also around tokenizing whiskey as an investment object. And it, it becomes really interesting when you can tokenize something that is not a security, right? Because then you can do much more with it. So you can tokenize a barrel of whiskey, uh, which is actually a great investment, but uh, but it's not a security, right? So it's it gives you more uh, 
possibilities in what you can do with the tokens. You're not so restricted in, in everything, but uh, you still need uh, yeah, a system to, to manage the tokenization effort itself. Um, we haven't seen, I think gold, you wouldn't necessarily tokenize probably, I don't know. There's, there's several, uh, there's, there's of co companies like, like yourself, right? That are using gold as, as, as assets to underpin some kind of stable stable coin or, or something like that. And I think that's, uh, that's probably more natural approach towards it. I think you might tokenize a gold mine, but maybe not, maybe not the, you wouldn't probably tokenize uh, a ton of gold or something like that in itself. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you would, and then you would use, then you would have the tokens to represent the ownership, of course, and, and you'd still get the value of appreciation. It, it, would, it would be easy to do, actually. So with that, you're talking about instead of tokenizing the shares, since it's not a security, uh, if you have a commodity or minerals or something, then you're able to actually uh, issue fungible tokens or, or NFTs for this, for this in individual, uh, for these, these commodities. And that, that would be different than the ownership of a house or something. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And much, much more simple, much simpler. Yeah. And so Paxos, uh, they, they have a, a platform. Well, actually they have a process for doing this. They, for, for gold, uh, they hold that gold in, in the treasury. Yeah. Um, so, and then they, they issue those tokens. Uh, do you see, so gold is something that um, it has uses uh, in, in circuit boards. It definitely has use, uh, maybe not as much use as, as something like copper. Um, yeah. You see the same uh, idea going for something more like copper, uh, maybe maybe even silver yeah. with with more use. Yeah, why not? Yeah. It's an easy it's an easy business model to make, I think, and uh, and it's basically just creating, make turning it into a you know, an investable asset and a tradable asset, right? Yeah. At the end of the day. Yeah, and I think freeing up that liquidity. Um, specifically on decentralized exchanges uh, yeah. for everyone to participate in. That's when it gets really interesting. And yeah. I think I saw something that that you guys were were coming on to uh, in into the DeFi landscape. Uh, yeah. Was it Binance or oh, what's the no. what's the process? What's the stage there? Yeah, we well, actually we are going to uh, uh, create our own uh, exchange for for real estate assets initially. In a, it's a collaboration with Balancer. Uh, so we're going to use that liquidity pool technology and AMM technology to create, yeah, trading technology, you could say for real estate assets, which is more demanding than, than normal crypto assets because first, of course, because it's a security. So everything has to be regulated and licensed and uh, whitelisted and so on, KYC, which is uh, not easy from a legal perspective. Um, and then also because the liquidity is expected to be quite low, at least initially. So how do we make thousands of real estate assets liquid uh, or provide enough liquidity for them to actually uh, be, be, be tradable to some degree? So that's a long-term effort. And, uh, but something that uh, we'd like to uh, help resolve, I would say, there's a lot of interest in trading real estate and uh, basically all everyone that uh, develops owns real estate is interested in getting it to be more liquid. Yeah, so we just need to get the, the, the retail adoption as well and get the retail investors into the space. Um, today, I think it's less than, it's, it's a few percent of the global population that owns real estate as an investment object. So, but, but, uh, but the majority of people are actually interested in, in doing it, right? But they want to, they don't want to invest a hundred thousand, which is the requirement today. They want to invest maybe a hundred or a thousand. So it, and, and that's, that's interesting. I, I actually have two questions off of that. So when you have a, a, a DEX properly, like, like Uniswap, like Uniswap V2, let's, let's take it uh, fairly simply where it was a, a a two-sided liquidity pool. Um, if if you have a real estate marketplace, would you be able to have uh, a, a liquidity pool of, of yeah. one real estate asset and another real estate asset in that that same pool? Is, is that is that what we're talking about, or is it more 
like a real estate asset and stable coin or any yeah. uh, more yeah. okay yeah yeah i think i think uh, so i'm not the expert actually on our team in this but but the way that we have that we see it is that there will only be one real estate asset in each liquidity pool and then uh, something that it trades against and it has to trade against something that is just extremely liquid as i understand it so like usdc or ethereum or uh, bell the balance the token right or, or brick our own token so uh, but but i don't i doubt you'd see two real estate properties being traded against each other but i think that actually with the balance of technology is possible to do it because you can sort of uh, yeah interlink different uh, trading pairs so so in principle it's you, you should even be able to do it if there's enough liquidity right yeah yeah that i think that'll be that'll be very interesting and and yeah. once there is enough liquidity uh for each uh pair uh that that'll be a really interesting route to go from uh from pool to pool and 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 home to home uh, for the uh, you know smaller participant. Um, if if I owned a home and my home is uh, you know worth five hundred thousand dollars and I have uh, maybe paid down half the mortgage, so I I own two hundred fifty outright. Um, of that two hundred fifty, would I be able to tokenize part of it and yeah. offer it up in into liquidity and maybe even yeah. uh, leverage it, lend against, borrow against it, yeah. things like yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you would. Eventually, yeah. <laughs> okay. When the technology becomes good enough, uh, I would say, and the liquidity becomes high enough, uh, you would eventually be able to do it um, in a few years. Yeah, I think. Yeah. So something that we that we noticed as well, um, kind of switching gears a little bit, is. Uh, that you have a partnership with Binance Smart Chain as far as like tokening, tokenizing assets on their chain. Yeah. Um, I've also seen uh, a partnership with Ravencoin as well for their yeah. blockchain. Um, sort of what, what kind of uh, what interests you about you know Binance Smart Chain in particular, and uh, what do you usually look for when going onto a particular chain uh, to tokenize there? We look for for one thing uh, first, and that is uh, a client that actually wants it. Uh, but we also look for community, community size, community engagement around the chain. Um, Ravencoin is relatively small, right? But there is this very strong community and a lot of uh, um, good, uh, good uh, passion around uh, initiatives that are running on Ravencoin, right? So we have actually seen a lot of interest in in, in tokenizing on Ravencoin, a bit surprisingly. Um, Binance Smart Chain, we haven't seen so much interest yet, I would, I, I would have to say. It was very easy to, for us to support because it's uh, uh, compatible with the Ethereum blockchain, right? So it, it, took, it took only about a week or something like, like that to, to add support for it. So it, it, a bit of a no-brainer. Uh, but I think there's also a lot of concern about sort of the centralization of the Binance Smart Chain that is keeping, uh, you could say, real estate, more, more conservative real estate developers maybe away from it. So we actually right now um, we also support Polygon, and I think uh, in the in the absence of Ethereum and the, the Ethereum gas fees being so high, I think Polygon is is also a good choice. Yeah, that that was actually my first thought when I saw uh, the, the Binance Smart Chain. I was like, I wonder what people think on the other end of sort of the centralization aspect, and you know, sort of they could you know maybe take ownership away or uh, you know yeah. shut things off you know from a centralized source. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We don't want that. We don't want that to happen. But uh, I would say even even if that were to happen, uh, security tokens are relatively uh, um, forgiving, I would say, to work with because they are securities. And again, it's required by securities regulation that you can always freeze them and reissue them to, to the correct owner. Uh, you can even forcefully remove them from someone back to the company. This, this is so, so you can do more with them than you can with Bitcoin, right? So if 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 you have tokens that are stuck on a chain and 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 and, and there is a fork and and all the activity moves over to another chain, it's very easy to freeze the old tokens and reissue on the on the new new chain. Or if if uh, Ethereum switches over to 2.0 and gas fees uh, drop hundred times, we we can also very easily migrate Polygon projects over to Ethereum 2.0. So it's 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 
you're not you're never sort of stuck in in a on a bad chain we can always resolve it that's incredible i didn't know that there was like a back door out of it i figured just you know once you're once you shut down like that's it you know it's it's done no 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 so but that's because it's like a share right so it's like a share if you if you have a share certificate on paper and you lose it right you have you have the right to get a new one printed for you wow yeah well i learned something today <laughs> <laughs> that's good we we have some folks asking about you know your your competitors in the space you said that um when you started there's there, there was probably five you were you were in the top five of of folks in the the asset tokenization space um you know, folks mentioning ix swap uh i also uh, i'm wondering about like polymesh like what's your thought on polymesh and um just general you know securities uh, platforms and offerings um what, what 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 is your thought in kind of the, the security token landscape today yeah i think it's it's actually the the, the same three, four, five players that we had four years ago are still uh, in the lead today. Uh, Tokensoft fell out, I think. Uh, a couple of other players uh, stopped. And, 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 and there are some newcomers, right? IXWAP is a newcomer. Um, we know them to some degree. We've spoken to them, but we don't, uh, we don't uh, collaborate with them. And we also don't see them so much, I would say, in Europe and, and the US. They are more Asia focused um but uh, yeah they could be a collaborator i think longer term um polymesh yeah so polymesh is of course the new chain that is uh, created by polymass to be uh, focused specifically on securities tokenized securities and be sort of institutional level security and uh, functionality and uh, we like it a lot actually and uh, we will also support it i think eventually uh, it's just a little bit it's more complicated than the chains that we normally look at so it will be a bigger effort i think from our side so we don't have it uh, in in our roadmap yet but i'm sure we will for later this year also i think we haven't really seen the adoption yet that sort of uh, um, demand it, it we are not in a hurry i think to support it uh, because we haven't seen uh, yeah, so much adoption yet but i think it will come uh, as, I think as the institutional start getting into the space, I think they will see Polymesh as, as probably the best alternative that we have on the market right, right now, unless they want to go for something like uh, uh, Hyperledger or uh, some of the permission chains that the banks put out. Right? But I hope not. <laughs> yeah, that, that wouldn't be uh, very interoperable no. at all. Uh, no. Absolutely not. So uh, when, when you're when you're evaluating the landscape, um, what what in your mind makes a uh, good project and and maybe a, a an up and coming or, or not so great project? And specifically, um, what do you what do you say, see as you know things that are really good for blockchain today and and you know uh, DeFi and things that that are kind of uh, maybe impeding uh, the adoption. Yeah, it's a great, it's a good question, right? Uh, it is, the crypto industry has always been a strange uh, mix of uh, really solid, uh, professional, uh, and idealistic projects, I would say, to some degree, but and and, and a mix and, and a, a lot of fraudulent, uh, overhyped projects, right? So you you learn to navigate in that space, and I think you quickly learn to sort the, the good from the bad to some degree and we are also contacted by many uh, significant number of companies that have uh, great ideas and great ambitions but uh, very limited budget and uh, maybe maybe uh, sort of uh, unrealistic plans to say the least to carry it out um, so it, i think it's natural for a space like this it's a new industry still and i think we saw the same back in the dot-com days I, i'm old enough to remember that um, where we also saw a lot of uh, overhyped uh, new companies getting a, a billion in, in funding, right, and then dying a year later. We see the same now uh, because it's difficult also for the investors, I think, to, to see what, uh, what's going to work out and what's not going to work out. So I think it's just natural, natural symptom from a new industry that is growing, is growing pains. Um, 
we don't we uh, so we we don't really sort so much i would say in the clients that we get in we do try to uh, we do try to uh, assist the clients i would say in scoping out their projects and making them more realistic and uh, understanding the requirements of a success, successful project right like for instance that you have your compliance and your legal uh, side uh, in, in in full order because otherwise you go to jail potentially right so that's pretty important but also the, the marketing side and the ability to uh, achieve investor interest and something like that is 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 a basic uh, requirement for any project right that needs to succeed in the space and a lot of people are not realistic about it uh, they think that just putting creating a web page will naturally uh, cause the investors to to come and put money in but it's much harder as as, as i'm sure that we we the three of us here will know so yeah i think aaron's question also begs the question of uh so then why you know sign on as an advisor with us at standard i think it's a great project and like i said in the beginning i'm really interested in DAOs myself personally uh, i think there is a great uh, future for it uh, uh, because because it it gives a general type of infrastructure for representing organizations and ownership interests and so on and there's a lot of overlap with what we're doing in, in the tokenization space so i think there's a lot of synergies that that needs to be realized and understood uh, to to uh, to uh, to gain real value and and I'd like to uh, yeah expose myself to that and that's yeah I will do that hopefully through you guys yeah we're better together I agree yeah absolutely Klaus um, actually and and Keaton had had a question around the um, the assets that would be on your platform um, is there uh, I, I think he's he's thinking around uh, the blockchain side of things but his question was uh, is your company platform using a proof of stake model yeah that's a, that's a great uh, question and um, in fact so on ethereum of course we have proof of stake right polygon is proof of 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 uh, of uh, of, uh, of uh, no 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 ethereum is proof of work right yeah, polygon is proof of stake proof of work Tr transferring yeah yeah so we are transferring over to proof of uh, of stake you could say um both by by intention but also by 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 need i would say market pressure yeah, something something that came up um that since you know I, I think about this quite a bit of you know in the inter age of the internet right there was it's kind of similar to crypto and like the crypto boom in a way where it was just this brand new technology like the government's kind of afraid of it no one really knows what's going to become of it yeah. and you know like I do think that they kind of got the regulation at least right to let the yeah. internet boom as it did. Yeah. But it, I don't know if that's necessarily the case for crypto as we've seen it kind of get banned, quote unquote, banned, yeah. by, you know, yeah. various nation states. And so do you think that there's any sort of regulatory policy that could actually derail us uh, yeah. the crypto sector as a whole? Yeah, I, I'm afraid that I'm, I'm afraid it could happen, right? So it, it is a risk that we, an ex existential risk that we all, share uh, and we sometimes ignore and, and close our eyes uh, but, and, and i think we have to, to to do that in order to to keep uh, keep working but but last week uh, there was a vote just in the european union about potentially banning proof of work protocols right and potentially yeah banning bitcoin to some degree from being used i think in in in, in business applications in europe which would be, I think, uh, not not good for the industry. I think the industry would survive and would find ways around it. But, but it would be a, a major challenge, I think, to overcome for the industry. And um, also last week or the week before, there was also the new uh, um, regulation, at least being sort of uh, hinted at in in the US, right? That could also have been a potential uh, showstopper for the space. So. So we really have to be careful, uh, and I think, and work on our lobbying efforts and uh, try to uh, avoid any uh, any regulation that is uh, negative for the space. I think I think we see a lot of good ideas from the regulators. I think it's great that they're working on investor protection and they're trying to uh, reduce sort of the the, the risk and the, the fraud that we see in the space. But but they have to do it on 
on uh, in a in a proper way, and they have to uh, always keep uh, comparing it to what we see in the in the existing financial industry, where we have a, a thousand times as much money laundering as we have in the crypto space, right? And where yeah, a lot a lot of financial fraud is just much easier in the in the existing financial ecosystem than it is in the crypto ecosystem longer term, right? So they really have to understand that before they regulate too much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Like they, they you know, it, it's an immutable ledger that they can read back on and you know find whoever's it's doing it yeah. at the end of the day, unless you're in the privacy coins or whatever. Um, yeah. So we did get a good question from M Sailor here, uh, asking if uh, you can talk about the tokenization of shares of a company in particular. Uh, if a small business wants to tokenize the equity of their real world business, uh, do you see that's coming in the near term? And uh, you know, what are your involvements in that? Yeah, that's that's basically what all our clients are, are doing today. So they they tokenize an LLC, LLC of of, of uh, in in some jurisdiction, right? And uh, um, and they offer those uh, tokenized shares for sale to their investors, to new investors, uh, in order to uh, sell off maybe part of the asset or. Uh, uh, make make also the asset liquid. I would say potentially for the existing investors, uh, um, and sort of create, I would say, free some free some some value from the asset that they can use for other purposes. Um, so of course, that's uh, right now the the technology behind this is not commoditized. So it's relatively, if it's a small project, then it it might be too small for it to be be worth it right now. Um, but but uh, but it's it's the price is dropping the price point is dropping quite fast so I think within a year or so uh, it will be so that most companies will be able to to do it. What types of things enable that that price point to to drop and how do you how much do you how much is it today and what do you see the cost being you know a few years down the line for for companies especially small ones. Yeah. So, so, uh, so, what we our business model is really to sell like a, a tokenization platform for companies that want to uh, tokenize both their own assets and also potentially for others. So there's a lot of administration functionality and uh, minting functionality and so on. And if you if you if you are just a, you could say a, a company owner and you want to tokenize just your own company, right? You probably go to one of our clients to get the service done, but and not to us, right? So we 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 our business model is to charge a software license fee uh, from people who want to set up a tokenization service. You could say in their own industry, their own uh, country, region, uh, and then allow them to tokenize on behalf of of us, and they can make their own business model, of course, and they can make it relatively inexpensive if if they like. It's not it's it's up to them and uh, to to determine that business model. Um, so uh, so we see the price point dropping really because the technology is maturing. Um, where today you could say there are only a few providers in the space, and the technology is is in demand. I would say in heavy demand. Have, of course, we can we can charge more, and we also have to charge more because the technology is not is not sufficiently scalable yet. I would say uh, there is a cost of deploying it and uh, customizing it, and so on. And the, I would say that the overall technology around the space is still uh, early stage, so a lot of it is developing quite fast with uh, configuration options, payment services, uh, custodians. Uh, all those different uh, parties in the ecosystem that needs to to work together to make this a success. It's developing all the time, right? And that's costing providers like us a lot of money and a lot of effort to keep up with that. And also on the regulatory side, it's changing all the time, right? So we have to spend time and uh, money on keeping track on that and sort of implementing into the system. But all that is bound to stabilize and converge at some point. And then I think we will see the, the price point dropping. And it's, it's already, I think, happening to some degree. Yeah. And uh, so you mentioned that 89% of the tokenization of asset space is dominated by real estate, mostly. Um, do you, what, what do you see as the, the next kind of big industry uh, coming in to the, the tokenization space um, yeah. for, for you guys? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, that's a, from 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 ours from I would say 
uh, there, there are, of course, there are other assets like energy and uh, mining and uh, commodities and uh, maybe expensive arts and uh, collectibles and so on. But I think those asset classes are relatively small actually compared to real estate and uh, will not uh, will not will never be able to reach the same size. But I think private equity and uh, startup crowdfunding and sort of private markets tokenization in general, I think, will be potentially even bigger than real estate. But it's just a little bit more complicated and it's uh, more institutional as well. So it's 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 much bigger companies, much bigger funds, and the value proposition is a different one. So where uh, it's not so much about uh, fractionalization so much maybe more anymore is more about uh, digitization i would say uh, working processes uh, back office uh, functions and so on so it's a different value proposition and, and we are not we are not as a company so good at it yet uh, but i think uh, we'll see it more and more coming in the future yeah i think something we're curious of we're kind of you know running out of time um so what what does the future of digital shares hold for us? You know, the next year or two. You know, what are you guys working on? Maybe you can talk about. Obviously, you know, can't talk about it. <laughs> yeah, we're working on this exchange, right? So that's that's uh, really uh, yeah, exciting for us to be able to uh, develop that and hopefully launch it around mid mid uh, mid year this year uh, out of Germany initially and uh, actually being able to approach retail investors in all of Europe for it to begin with, but we want to, to also have a license in the US and in Asia, maybe out of Singapore, so we can cover the whole world. It will be a decentralized exchange, but but still centralized to some degree because we have to whitelist all the investors going in and we are responsible to the, the regulators for running it. Uh, so it cannot be fully decentralized. Uh, so that's extremely exciting, I think, for us. And the next big step in the development of the company. And then after that comes DeFi lending, which will also be very exciting. That seems like a step, not just for your company, but for the majority of the DeFi space to yeah. integrate with, with regulators. So that, that, that is yeah. very exciting. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think, you, Klaus, we have, uh, pe people are very interested in kind of the competitive landscape. Um, do you, are there kind of, do you have like a top three of, of yeah, I don't know if I want to say it, but uh, <laughs> no, I think I think basically uh, the key competitors that we see in the space is, is securitized in the US, it's tokeny in Europe, uh, maybe Vitalo in the US as well. Um, those are probably the typical companies that we are being compared against. Then there's maybe ten other companies uh, that are, in, from my in my view, more immature and, and not not able to deliver a solid platform and uh, solid processes around it, right? And project managers and SLAs and stuff like that, which is uh, boring stuff, but required if you want to deliver high quality products. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, no, Klaus, th th this, has been, this has been great. We absolutely appreciate your expertise uh, being on the board for standard. Uh, we are looking forward to building with you uh, shortly here, uh, many updates there to come um, and really uh, building uh, infrastructure specifically to, to fund very impactful mandates. Uh, that's what yep. we're really excited about. So yeah, thanks yep. for coming on. And thanks everyone else for, for coming on uh, the chat and engaging with us. This has been a, a, a great conversation and uh, we'll, we'll see you all in the next one. Yeah. Thank you very much Thanks. for inviting me. <laughs> Absolutely. Much appreciated. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.